join me in, uh, I want to do this in Mark, the ninth chapter, the ninth chapter of the book of Mark. To my satellite, my campus pastors, I love all of you. God bless you. You're so wonderful. Um, Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And um, I'm going to read down to about verse 26. I prefer this in the Living Bible, but for the sake of time, I'm going to just read it in the KJV. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. When you're there, say, I'm there. If you're not there, say, wait on me. Okay. All my Apple users tell those wait on me's to hurry up. It's got to be those droids. Mark chapter 9, verse 14, and when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. I think the Living Bible says the crowd. Verse 15 says, and straightway all the people, all the people, them, that, him, her, she, it, those, all the people. Say all the people. When they beheld him. They were greatly amazed, and they ran to him hmm. to salute him. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth his teeth, and pineth away. And I went to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long will I suffer with you? I love this. Bring him to me. <laughs> and they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tore him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it since this boy has been this way? And he said, since a child. And oft times it casteth him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if you will believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help mine unbelief. But when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he charged, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying, Thou deaf and dumb spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch many said, He is dead. In the subsequent verses of this, the disciples get to Jesus privately, and they wait until the cameras are off, and they wait until nobody's there, and they wait until the line is gone, and they ask him, why couldn't we cast it out? Father, help me preach this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the facts of theological interpretation is the pendulum principle, which basically means when a principle is introduced, it's always introduced in an extreme. And then do several generations, it goes to the other extreme. And it takes several decades for us to find the middle. And uh, when things are introduced to us, they seldom come to us in and with objectivity. For example, when we're dealing with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, one thought and one belief is that you are only going to heaven if when you get to the gates, you can verify that you speak with tongues. <laughs> so they act like when you get to heaven, the entry angel is going to say, come on, let me hear. Did you tear it for it? Is it in there? It is an extreme. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Say yes. yes. But I also believe that there's a lot of people talking in tongues that ain't saved. Point number two. <laughs> I think one of the things that the Lord is doing is he's raising up ministries that's going to bring the balance. And, and when I say balance, I'm not talking about just lifestyle balance and have fun and an occasional vacation. I'm talking about a doctrinal balance. One of the, the, the great, great, great uh, platforms that you and I have inherited is a platform of error because of mistreated text and mistreated uh, phenomena. The truth is, and I'll give you my text midway, if the church is to have any shot at a future, here we go. We're going to have to get back to the casting out of devils. I 
I thoroughly enjoy, I'm creeping there, studying the ministry of Jesus. I love how he started. He's my role model. He's my example, my exemplar. He is goals. And what I appreciate about how he started his ministry was he did not start it evangelistically necessarily. He actually began his ministry in Matthew chapter 4 and 5 in what the Bible calls a synagogue. Now, in order for you to appreciate that, you've got to realize that the Gentiles were not allowed in the synagogue, which means that it wasn't like us. There was no such thing as family and friends day. If you were in the synagogue, you were a traditional rabbinic Jew. Say yes. That meant that the only people that had access in the synagogue were those that were created or those that were considered saintly. You had to be born from national Israel. And, uh, you know, when we see Jesus step on the scene with what we would call his trial sermon, how he opened up the whole thing, the Bible said that he opened up the scriptures in a place called Isaiah 61. Esaias is what it's called. And the Bible say in the middle of him reading that he says in this day, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And if, if that did not add insult to injury, right after he put the period on the conclude of that statement, all of a sudden, somebody from the back of the room says, oh, no. Hey, Chris. Jesus. Have you come to torment us before our time? But I just told you what no unbelievers in there. I, th th there was no such thing as a heathen. There was no family and friends day, which makes us offended at this number one theological premise, which means you can be saved and have a devil. That's number one. Number two is that I want you to realize what's transpiring. Drive and fast forward with me, if you will, later into the ministry of Jesus. He is about to transition out and he's asking his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they are in confusion about who the guy is. Some say you're this and some say you're that and some say you're this. But what I find interesting is that his first encounter with Satan, he knew exactly who Jesus was, and yet three years later, the disciples were still in doubt on who the man said he was. It's quite interesting that for many of us, the devil got more confidence in what we care than we do. Uh, and so the Bible said that when Jesus started to preach, something negatively, something demonic, something celestial, but not from heaven, from hell, reacted in the synagogue at what Jesus said. We go into the moral of the story, the Bible says, says that not only did Jesus tell the devil to shut up, pay attention, because his attitude was, this is my house, not yours, and I'm not going to allow you to take the attention away from me by asking you who are you and where you come from and what you like and what's your sign and do you like long walks on a No, Jesus' deliverance style was this, shut up and come out. We ain't got nothing to talk about and you're not about to take the time here. You need no attention and gets no glory on my house. I don't care who you are. You're coming out today. And so he tells the man, be muzzled. But then, here is the Bible language, and he came out of him. Can we say that together? He came out of him. Say it again. He came out of him. He, listen, the demon came out of him, the man. Pay attention. What we would have done was kick the man out of the church and left the demon in the man. What Jesus did, he let the men in black stand down and he allowed the devil to come out of the man because there was a soul in there that was being claimed by something filthy. He, the demon, pay attention, came out of him, the man. I am perplexed particularly at the placement of this gospel. In Matthew's gospel, it shows up in the 17th chapter, but in Mark's gospel, it shows up in the 9th chapter. And the reason that that doesn't really bless you much is because Jesus had just, here we go, taught them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then in Mark 16, and then again in Matthew 28, he uses this phrase, behold, I give unto you power. Pay attention. In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, he says, behold, I give unto you power, which means that Jesus never taught power. This is, this is what I mean by the pendulum. Because when you are a child of Pentecost and you are a child of the latter rain movement and you are a child of all things Azusa, we were bred with an appetite for power. We Power, Lord. Power, Lord. Send your power. More power. And while that's not bad, it is ignorant. Because Jesus didn't teach power. Pay attention. He had no reason to teach power if he was going to give it. 
And there is a difference between giving power and teaching power, which means that if power is not the lesson, we have a greater issue. It suggests that power is easy to get once you have something before power. I'll make it make sense in a minute. I think that if we were to imagine the church without a struggle for being power hungry, we would be able to speak to a deeper mal malady, which is perhaps our problem is not the absence of power, it's the lack of faith. Pay attention. Our crisis is that in New York City, in Chicago, in Atlanta, in Florida, the lights have gone out. And the reason why the lights have gone out is because in order to shine, you've got to be connected to a source. Ah, but we don't really draw the energy from the light. We draw energy from the power source. But we need a premise now to connect us so that we can shine. Can I give you a word real quick? The power outage is over. God is about to raise your faith. Shout hallelujah! So now we see Jesus, here we go, coming off of his itinerant journey. And in his itinerant journey, there was never a place he went into and he didn't cast the devil out. I love the fact that he's always around the crowd. Pay attention. He forced himself to try to belong in the congregation. But the Bible says he went to his own and his own received him not. So when he chose to remove himself, pay attention, from the common and the familiar nature of those in the congregation, he went to where he was celebrated. And I have a word for many of you. For the rest of your life, you will never be celebrated in the congregation. But you will be praised by creation what was on your life was not sent to church people and that's exactly why they hated Jesus because they said look at him eating with them hoes and sinners and tax collectors and Jesus said look at this I did not come call to call the righteous but I came to call the sinner to repentance and where there is sin there's going to be demons sit down we've not resolved that some of the issues of the human race are not just psychological and emotional. We've not resolved that some of this stuff is not genetic. A lot of this stuff is pure right demonic. And it is our absence of knowledge and our lack of insight about what demons do that's got us demonizing people and not dealing with what's in them. We've been in a situation where now when people come to us dirty, we want to try to wash them externally. But Jesus had an internal investment. Before I judge the man, I'm going to try to find out what's occupying the soul and if there is something in there that I didn't put there I, I can't hear no, I want it out. Now here's a problem in many cities around the world, get mad with this, the only time you hear the phrase come out is for an event come out to my conference and come out to my recording but I believe somebody stirring in New York with a brand new come out. Now let me help you and that term come out is in the Greek ekbalo. you know what it means? To evict and violently throw out. It does not mean to get over hey it does not mean to move across it means to take that ninja by the neck and say this is not your house this is not your life this is not your story not your destiny you got to get out somebody scream come up the situation is Jesus finds himself among the crowd pay attention and the crowd is synonymous with the culture can I give you my first premise one of the reasons why we'll never be acknowledged among those in the congregation is because we've been assigned to the culture if and when the church is blessed then fine but my aim is the culture my goal is the culture the Bible says that we are to make disciples of nations not congregations and if church people get blessed on the way then I'm all good but my aim is those 
those that the church don't want. I want those uh, that's bored and unimpressed. I want those uh, who have an attitude that says whatever I've had before is good, uh, but today it's not enough. Uh, and I was born in the fire, so I can't stand the smoke. I want the power of God. Uh, I believe there is a generation in this city asking whatever happened uh, to the power of God. Uh, we got distracted, Becca. We thought the power of God was getting slain, uh, but a mere change in gravity can make you fall on the floor. There is a whole category of miracle that we ain't seen a whole category of deliverance that we ain't seen and what's going on now is God has heard the cry of a people that's tired of dancing without their deliverance and he has come down to deliver shout hallelujah the situation is Jesus is found appealing to a culture a culture and the Bible says he's found among the crowd and out of the crowd, a guy comes up to him. This is expodulation of my text. And tells him, hey, I bought my son to your disciples. Because that's what we do when we don't know who he really is. We go to those who we think do. And we rely on those that we thought walked with him. Oh, yes. And we go to those that represent him with the assumption that because you preach for him, you must know him. And, and because you quote his Bible, you must know him. And, and because you sing his song, you got to know him. But then very many people are grievously disappointed when they go to people that speak for him. And yet they have a strong man and a strong hold and a thing that's gripping an entire generation. And there is no resistance. Results. So the best, the, 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 the place of the greatest disappointment in the average church is the altar. So much so where folks have just stopped coming because they're tired of the cycle. Isn't it what we do? We allow them a moment of temporary relief, but we do absolutely nothing about what's claiming them. Now, in order to understand before I go to my next verse, I've got to give you a parenthetical point, which is this. The enemy sees your life as personal real estate. Now, I know you don't understand that, but the Bible says this. When an unclean spirit help me through here who goeth out of a man watch this he goes through dry places seeking rest and findeth none here's what he does he says I good God from Zion will I can't hear nobody go back my lamb to my house so here's the deal there's a war over your life whether you know it or not the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost but your grandfather may have opened up something else that's claiming your life as its own now in order for you to understand why this is even more important you got to understand that the devil is only as effective as the body he's in so this is why deliverance is important without a body he can't do nothing you ought to be you ought not be worried about what's operating in the heavenlies you got to worry about what's operating in Harold and worry about it operating in them I leave the heavens to the angels but when it comes to warfare I'm dealing with what's occupying bodies on the earth anyway Imagine rather the disappointment of a father who was at and observed and heard of the ordination of the twelve out here. You was just helping. Remember the other day, y'all were casting out devils and Jesus said, don't rejoice over that. Rejoice that your name is written. And, and I, I thought the training would work. But I brought my son to your disciples and they couldn't do it. And Jesus diagnoses him, and here is our next point, and then looks at his disciples. Pay attention. If you contextualize this text, the rebuke is very unusual. He calls his disciples faithless and perverse, which means that the source of all things perverse is not sex. Wherever you have an agenda of the perversion of anything, the root of it is not going to be closed and it's not going to be what you were baptized in and it's not going to be whether or not you are a Sabbath worshiper or whatever. The root of it is going to be that there may be a fundamental fracture in your faith. Jesus rebuked two types of people, the faithless and the hypocrite. Y'all put all y'all energy at sinners and you overlook the hypocrite sitting right next to you. You put all your energy at sinners and people that are broken, but you overlook the bias, the, the phobia that's standing right in front of you. And so I see a real critical paradox here. Perhaps power is the easier discussion than faith. And we know this because all of the New Testament is about faith in the Son of God. 
It is interesting to me that even in the context of deliverance, Jesus easily addresses this demon which does several things. This generation is likened unto what's going on in that boy. First of all, in the Living Bible, the Bible called him a lunatic. Who in the world walks in a grocery store, opens some ice cream, licks it, closes it, See, here's the deal. I'm not all the way saved yet, so I'd have slapped him on your behalf. I'd have just stole on her in case you got it. That's how much I love people. There is a real spirit of insanity that's out in the world. And if you've not paid attention, it's getting stronger and it's getting stronger. Men are literally out of their minds. And one of the reasons why they have the right to exist this way is because the church is busy performing in a don't ask, don't tell agreement with hell. What we're doing is if we don't mess with you, you don't mess with us. We're going to come in this service for 90 minutes and not once ask if anybody wants deliverance, if anybody has an addiction, if anybody was born in a strong man, we're going to praise our way out. But the problem is you can't praise the devil out. One of the worst things they could have taught us was hell was afraid of our hallelujah. My boy throws himself, pay attention, I want to give you character traits of this spirit. He throweth himself into the fire. This is a category of demon that imposes and inspires self-inflicted wounds. Now you may be sitting here, you're like, I ain't never threw myself in the fire, but maybe you date things that's not good for you. Say fire. Maybe you have addictions that's not good for you. Say fire. So you're not throwing yourself into a literal fire, but if you use what you call recreational drugs, which I don't understand why anything recreational should take you out of your mind. It is the same, I know you don't like that. It's the same power of addiction and it operates in every area. Now, wherever you have a gift and wherever you have an assignment, you're going to have an attack. And it has been my experience that the strongest gifts have to be delivered from the power of addiction. It's the devil's way of taking your discipline and using it for his purpose so that your destiny will never get it. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Your destiny is only as access as you are disciplined. So if the devil knows that you have a deep capacity for discipline, he touches it and makes it an addiction. He throws himself into the fire. And not only does he throw himself into the fire, he imposes himself to harm. Harmful relationships and harmful friendships and harmful diets. Another thing that he does is he cuts himself. He makes sure that he feels the pain he thinks he deserves. There is a, there is a profound demon in the earth today that's got people in such immense self-hatred that they do all kind of illogical things and allow it to be done in them. It's a very powerful psychological torment. And then the Bible says if the fire don't kill him, then he ends up going into the water. Now I know that this is not a new subject but we're just not hearing a lot about it in the last five years I have never seen so many people in anxiety in my life in the Bible when you're dealing with this boy throwing himself into the water you're dealing with the spirit of panic if you've never almost drowned realize that a part of what does not go first is your breathing your nerves you overreact and then it weakens your breath that is a sign of anxiety and many people around the world there is an anxiety about the future there is an anxiety about the past there is an anxiety about money there is an anxiety about acceptance there has been an increase of a nervous spirit that has come out and here's the problem it's not just hitting people over 50 it's coming out to those that are in their early 20s I smell the smog of the Holy Ghost choking anxiety in this room I feel like those of you woo, that are nervous about how you're gonna retire and nervous about how you're gonna pay for school and nervous about what's going to happen to your children. Tonight is the night of deliverance and God's going to deliver you at the nervous system. I can't get no help back there. I said God's going to deliver you in your nervous system. In your nervous system. Ask me why. Be anxious for nothing. But everything by prayer and by fasting. Shout hallelujah. After he throws himself in the water, then he goes into seizures. Seizures. That is a, a breakdown and a malfunction of the brain. Mental exhaustion. Rebellion of the systems and the processes of the head. We are in such psychological warfare as a culture. 
and it's because we sit in front of things that feed us tormenting ideas and ideals. Don't realizing that some of it is just not good for the soul. So we're singing and we're dancing and the soul is corroding because what's going on in our head is in conflict with what's going on in our mouth and anybody will tell you that makes mental illness. When you decree things you do not believe, you are short circuiting yourself mentally and you're teaching yourself to be a hypocrite. This is why there's so many pathological liars in the earth who lie without reason to lie. It's because for years they were taught to fake it till you make it and all the while God wasn't trying to get you to fake nothing. He was trying to do something in you so your faith could grow. Now, here's my assignment tonight. Many people in the room have lost faith for their deliverance because you thought it was deliverance by power and it was not. It's not a matter of how much power you have. And because that is the goal, we've got us competing against each other to try to attain something that ain't ours to begin with. Say why? God has spoken once. They don't want to help me. Yet twice have we heard him. Power does not belong to you. And power does not belong to y'all. Power is God's. So if power is God's, there's only one way to get it. And it's not by being good enough. It's by having faith. The competition for power has y'all in performance. And so what, what happens is when we want deliverance, if we don't get free, we're like, oh, he or she or them, ain't no power over there. When the real truth is, power is the byproduct of increased faith. And the majority of Christians you know only have faith enough for salvation but nothing else. What they teach you is faith to be saved. Believe that Jesus is real. After that, it's all up to you. You, 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 you got to prove that you heard in prayer. You got to prove that you're good enough. You got to earn your right to be delivered. And here's the, here's the funny part. We are in a generation. Ooh. We are in a generation that thinks it's normal and natural and Christian to have a deaf section in the church. We got a whole segment of people whose ears are stopped up and we read a Jesus who every time anybody walked up on him, I said that and asked him to be set free. He rebuked it. Y'all accommodate handicaps and still tell people they ain't got no power when the real truth is you got more logic than you got faith. Watch me. And the just don't live by their power. And the just don't live by what they were taught. The just live by their faith. Y'all like a little faith and a little law. Because then it makes you feel like you've earned the power you got. You're good with the faith stuff at a certain point. But then something in you like, you give me just a little law. I need a little bit of Moses in there. Because then I don't have as much power. What I love is this conversation with the disciples. Imagine how embarrassing it must have been for Jesus to rebuke you in front of the people that needed you and then bring you into private quarters and say, I can't wait to get away from you. If he loved them so much, why was he so annoyed? Faithlessness. You can be around it and not have faith like you need to. Now, I understand your dilemma. You think faith for things. You know, the how I'm going to pay my rent, all my money spent, a little bit to buy some shoes, baby need a pair of shoes, look, you got a light bill due, even got a gas bill too. My telephone is disconnect. I'm waiting on my next paycheck. I tell you what you ought to do. Jesus will see you through. And Jarrell, we wonder why people don't want to get saved. First of all, if I heard that nightmare, I would never leave the life I had. Sounds like you got a sad baby daddy. I don't know why you want me to get saved and he let you get down to your last dime. What in the world are we teaching people? You get saved to be broke and saved to live in struggle? No. In everywhere there was faith, there's supposed to be a connection to a resource that you don't have. You were struggling without God. Why did you come into God to live the same way, defeated? It's it's religious we would much rather have a doctrine for our defeat than to believe that we were taught wrong say faith say faith I'm in a job season Just treat me like Job I feel you're kicking it I don't care I'm, in, I'm going to a job season Job lost everything he had. Though if you have ever shouted, this is going to offend you. 
danced, ran off of though he slay me. Yet will I trust you. You're ignorant. Because if God were trying to slay Job, I feel this. He's never tried to kill anybody. My biblical record, so everybody he wanted dead, he killed. So it could have been, pay attention, that you shouted too soon and didn't get to the end of Job's story when Job concluded his own book by saying, everything I just said, see y'all didn't read that. He said, I wrote about things I did not comprehend. It literally meant he was out of his mind and y'all are shouting off of something somebody said when they were in a moment of insanity. The problem with the story was God was not trying to kill Job. He was trying to promote him. And sometimes when God is trying to promote you, you're going to feel like he's trying to keep shout hallelujah he was working the man's faith glory he was letting them know for you to be alive in this demonized culture you need a little more faith now the bible gives us levels and realms and measures of faith first of all faith is a law secondarily faith is a level thirdly it is a dimension but the important thing is you can move in levels of faith when he was talking about this type of demon he didn't tell them your power ain't strong enough he said you don't have the right amount of faith now here is what i don't understand we have faith for healing, faith for houses, and faith for cars. We don't believe that it's holiness by faith. I know you're uncomfortable. We think it's holiness by works, but everything else is faith-based. To get to healing, you've got to have faith. But holiness, you've got, you got to do stuff. If it's not in faith, it's in idolatry. Period. It's either going to be faith or not. There is no middle wall. But because our doctrine is partial and we love abusive teaching, we gravitate towards that that makes us want to earn what he got for free. Jesus, why couldn't we? Because we passed the test and went through the training. Why couldn't we cast it out? Which is a question every preacher in America needs to ask himself. Why am I bullying what I don't have authority over? And why am I bashing what I can't cast out? I said that. And why am I judging that that's not responding to what I thought was upon me? We need to go internal with some of these interviews and ask ourselves, what about who I am? And is the truth is there is a distance between me and what I declare? Is there a disparity between what I'm preaching and what I really believe? Because the real truth is, if you don't have faith and preach the Bible, it's just like any other history book. What makes the Bible come alive is your faith in the Son of God. If you don't have faith in the Son of God, you're reading riddles and writings and poems. The real truth is, not that the devil is busy, but the church is faithless. It's a hard thing to hear. But this is why so many people are not delivered. We really are in a faith war. And God has been trying to reach you at the faith level for everything. But we have a massive fear of reliance on God. We, we really like to do a little bit of him and a little bit of them. But in a life of faith, no devil has rights there. It's the only thing beyond the name of Jesus has had the right to arrest the forces of darkness. And what you'll notice is the closer you get to God, the more faith you're going to need. In distance from him, you don't need a lot of faith. He was addressing those that he taught directly. And what I've seen, pay attention, is the closer I get to God, the more I feel like I don't have enough faith. <laughs> Let me break it down. If you are not in that place in your life when you're like, God, how? God, who? God, why? Then you miss God somewhere. God never calls people to do that that they are able to do without him. If you can afford it, it's not him. If it's in your budget, it's not him. If, you can, if it's realistic, it's not him. God always calls men to mountains and men to things that are bigger than him. Why? You're going to need him to get it done. If you don't need him, it wasn't him. It's faith. The disciples are troubled. Why can we cast it out? He said, because your faith is so small. And then he tells them this. If you have, look at this scientific comparison. If you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, which means that faith can come in sizes. 
One of the things that I'm learning is after every trial in your life, you should graduate in your faith. If you go through and your faith level does not change and you went through with no reason, the objective of your going through is not your testimony. That's stupidity. God allows you to go through so you can believe him more. He's not writing some story to impress people. He's got his own reputation intact. He's never lost a battle. He don't need you to help tell about how good he is. He's been being God since from before the mountains were brought forth. That means that God is not trying to allow you to go through for your testimony. He's trying to allow you to go through uh, because sometimes it takes for the environment to reveal what's really in you. Uh, and when you make it out of certain things, uh, and when you live through certain things, uh, and when you speak through certain things and you survive, uh, there is a measure of resilience that can only come through faith. Uh, and you know who I have an appreciation for? I used to have an appreciation uh, for victorious people. And then I used to have an appreciation uh, for confident people. You know who my new heroes are? The struggler. I love people uh, who can... I love strugglers because strugglers come out with strength they come out with a different name if you've ever struggled through something and had the nerve to fight back you qualify for the future I believe there's some fighters I can't get help in here I said there's some fighters in here we couldn't cast them out this lunatic spirit this self-destructive spirit we couldn't cast them out if you will say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And that's at mustard seed faith. I don't think the majority of us have the mustard level. We should not be perplexed about why America looks like it is if those that name the name of Christ are struggling to believe him. If mustard seeds move mountains, why do you have so many? Can we just give room for some honesty? If Mount Everest, Kilimanjaro, responds to mustard level, why is alcoholism hard? Why is pornography hard? Why, why is the resurrection of the dead, in my estimation, moving a mountain is a much more complex issue. It brings us into a real devastating reality that with all of our activity, there's still very little movement. Let me give you a, a, a parable. I live in Chicago. Y'all know snow, we know snow. Several years ago, um, I had a Cadillac CTS. And they were when they were hot. This had to be like 2007, 2008. It was all black, it was custom. And uh, this was a year where it had snowed probably about six feet. There was a lot of snow. The, people were abandoning their cars on Lakeshore Drive and everywhere. My wife needed to get out, and there was not an armor bearer, a snow removal company, a son, daughter, disciple, neighbor, willing worker. Nobody was available. I had the arduous task of trying to prove to her that I was still worthy to be her husband. So I clothed myself even in the armor of God, and I went outside to try to dig out my car. It took me about two and a half hours to get there. When I got to my car and I could finally see it, I got in. And certainly, there was a way made to do it. Got in. Boop. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Car starts up. I put it in reverse. And then something's going on. Do it again. And again. And again. And again. And again. And again. I could not comprehend how with all of this activity, the engine was working, lights were working, bunch of shaking, no movement. We are trapped in a winter season in the body of Christ where we're distracted by all of the activity and the devil has robbed us from the fact that although we're conferencing and prayer breakfasting and men's gathering and football field heaven, we ain't going nowhere. We just shaking a lot. And we will know when we're moving when men are set free. God 
is going to anoint this life. I'll speak to the other ones when we get there. With such a powerful anointing against addiction that it's going to be unreal. When we walked in today, I begin to hear the desperation of men and women that are hiding their addictive behavior because the last time they tried to admit it they were judged and they were broken and and their trust was abused because then you had to be warned about it so all of your secrets were outed and everything that you warned with was put out there but tonight something different is in the air <laughs> I feel that Mark 16 anointing he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved whoever believeth not shall I'll be damned in my name they will cast out devils now listen we can deal with the devil tonight but tomorrow you're gonna have to do something about the damage I don't know what that means switch your church I said that too I don't know what that means get you a therapist I don't know what that means get a mentor I can handle the devil but you got to handle the damage sometime when you don't deal with the damage the devil comes back because he loves damaged goods And you're not going to tell me we ain't got a power outage because of what's going on on your block. It's so bad, Pastor Nelson, that the Jehovah's Witnesses are more bold than tongue-talking Christians. We avoid them because they know more of our Bible than we do. So they got us hiding behind our blinds. No, no, not today, not today. And you ain't led Nan's soul to God all year. You're learning prophecy tricks. Blindfolding yourself to impress church people. And there are hoodlums on your corner who need a word from the Lord because the God of death has claimed them. And you want to hurry up and get here to prophesy to one of us. And the reason y'all do it is for courtesy falls. Y'all know in here, we'll fake it like you anointed. But when you're in the streets, they don't know enough to make you feel better about your gift. Listen here. You don't need faith to minister to church people. God wants to do something with your faith. There is a spirit of heaviness so profound in that balcony. I mean a real spirit of depression. And I'm not talking about having a bad day, but there's about 12 of you up there that struggle to get out of the bed. This is not God's best for you. You need faith for your deliverance. The power outage only exists where there's nobody that has faith. And the, and the rebuke of God tonight is our faith. We need it increased. Yes, sir. If for nothing, deliverance. Yes, sir. The truth is what the enemy does is he makes you more confident in what's wrong with you than what's right with you. And so we don't contend for deliverance. We give up. I, wow. This is an Anwa service, so I guess I'll do it. I believe right now, let this be a sign unto you, do not be embarrassed. If you look at them and jeer out, out all your business in front of everybody. If you're in here tonight and you got a nicotine or a weed or marijuana addiction, come run up here to me right now. Do not be embarrassed. Oh, you're not desperate, man. I, I, I can't hear. I need an intercessor. I need. I believe tonight God's going to do something in the taste buds. I said I believe tonight God's going to do something in the taste buds. Come on. Come on.
<laughs> we need you, we need you. We need you, we need you, we need you. I wish I had an intercessor to catch me in the spirit. We need you, we need you. We've exhausted our resources and we need you. We've tried it on our own and we need you. We went to get the patch and we need you. We tried to confess it but we need you. And our resolve tonight is that without you we're trapped. And without you we're destined for ruin. We need you. Jesus come in the room. Come on catch me. Jesus come in the room. We need a strong deliverer. 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 We don't want the mascot of hypocrisy Christianity. We don't want the guy that bullies everybody. We don't want the one that's full of hate. We need a strong God. We need the one whose arms are not too short. We need a strong God. Father, you said before we called that you you would answer and while we're yet speaking you were here these are not victims at these altars but you shed your blood for these you shed your blood for these and if you had to do it all over again you would do it for only one of them let the heavens be open right now let the heavens be open right now in the strong name of Jesus help me pray for a minute you spirit of shame you spirit of embarrassment you spirit of guilt and condemnation the blood of Jesus break your power the blood of Jesus break your power pray the blood of Jesus break your power you spirit of accusation you spirit of terror and turmoil torment in the mind you are under arrest I can hear you you are under arrest you are under arrest you are under arrest the name of the Lord is erected over every life the name of the Lord huh, is erected over every life. Huh? They don't deserve it, huh? but Jesus finished it. Huh? They didn't earn it, huh? but Jesus finished it. Deliver us! Deliver us! Deliver us! You spirit of addiction. I address you right now. You lodged in rejection, lodged in abandonment, lodged in fear, and I command you in the name of the Son of God to untie around these hearts, untie around these minds. In the powerful name of Jesus, you've got to break your power. In the name of Jesus, we put hooks in your jaws, drag you out now. Buckets of the blood, buckets of the blood, buckets and buckets, and buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets of the blood of Jesus against the kingdom of addiction against the power of nicotine you foul spirit and kingdom of addiction we bring you down now come on give me some workers come on y'all can go come on come on let them go if you're out there just stir this atmosphere deliverance Deliverance, strong deliverer, strong deliverer, strong deliverer. Will you help us, Pastor Jenkins? Strong deliverer, strong deliverer. You come out of there. You come out of there. You come out of there. You spirit of anger. You spirit of rage. You spirit of murder. We rebuke you now in the name of Jesus. Out. Go, 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 come on, go, 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 you come out, go, they don't want you. They don't want you. Get out of there. Come out, devil. Come on. Come on, go. Go. Come on, stir the room. 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 
spare the room spare the room spare the room every serpent and scorpion spare the room every dragon and adder spare the room raging fires and passion spare the room come on up 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 go deliver us oh god Where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, I said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, 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 come on, you kingdom of addiction, holding them back, keeping them hostage, holding them hostage, let them go. These are the redeemed, these are the redeemed, these are the redeemed, these are branches snatched out the fire, these are branches snatched out the fire, hey, pull from the water, yes Lord, yes Lord. Ah! Oh! 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 Fire! From the back to the front. The fire of God. Listen. How many of you? Uh, oh yeah, there he is. How many of you in this building are struggling in a soul tie of some form of relationship that God wants you out of? Be honest, it's just not good for you. You've been your worst since you've been involved with this person or even, you can also have a soul tie with a place, a form of employment or something that just will not allow you to flourish. Jesus Christ died for the best in you. Therefore, he would never send anybody in your life or in your space that would make you live the worst in you. If you want prayer for a soul type, run to this altar like your life depended on it. Come on, hurry up. Don't be embarrassed. Come on, lift those hands. We're going to contend with you. I have faith for your freedom. Oh. Uh, uh, listen, one of the forces that work in soul ties is witchcraft, and it's not just heebie jeebie, or but there are emotional ties to you and another thing at the soul level where your thinking is not under your own control your desires are not under your own control you have certain memories that draw you back and there are many of you who are in like a covenant like a vow and you know what I feel in my spirit is that some of you feel like if you move on that this person will die you put yourself in the savior seat like if you move on you don't know what's going to happen to them you need to release that person to God are you hearing me? You are not Jesus. You're not a savior. You need to release that person to God. And you got to be committed to obeying whatever the Lord is calling you to do in your life. Come on, get them hands up. Come on. Father, in the name of Jesus, these hearts are yours. These hearts are yours. And Lord, you know every detail. You know the dates. You know the times. You know the confessions. You know the decrees. Right now, I'm asking that you would stir faith in this room for to be released and emancipated from every ungodly covenant, every ungodly contract over their gift, their call, their assignment, their purpose, their salvation. Lord, tonight, uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, will you send uh, even warring angels uh, to begin to deal with the arrangements, begin to deal with the contracts written at the heart level uh, for these that are hungry and desperate for deliverance. Uh, Lord, right now, in Jesus' name, uh, we renounce the hold, uh, the bindings, uh, the, the co 
cohesive tie of every soul tie operating in their mind operating in their will even operating in their intellect for those in the room that are in love with married people and those in the room that have inordinate affection for friends and loved ones in the name of Jesus Christ will you by your hand reach in and pull out every photo come on every memory every covenant promise every vow every altar erected in the heart and the lives of these let every altar come down we need you to do it in the hearts in the mind in the will in the confession the fire of God on every soul tie the fire of Jehovah on every controlling force every psychic prayer claiming your life claiming your destiny I come against word curses oh yeah I come against word curses threatening you telling you you're not going anywhere without me you won't go anywhere without me in the name of Jesus you lying spirit of witchcraft every word curse spoken over you from vengeful lovers from bitter organizations I break the power and the authority over every curse over your life every curse over your destiny every curse over your mind over your sleep even out of your dreams you spirit of lust let these people's dreams go these are they that have had their robes washed these are they that have been ransomed by Judah these are they that have been snatched all the way by the strong hand of God you have no rights you have no access and we call your plan ruined we call your purpose weightless and ineffective in the strong name of Jesus we say your contract is void we say your arrangement is canceled we say your ownership has been revoked your rights and privileges has been reversed in the name of God's Christ let them go free let them go free let them go free I, we're, we're almost done come on keep them hands lifted if this is you you've got to you've got to reckon with the fact that if you are in a soul tie with anything the core issue is idolatry something that deserves your obedience or your loyalty more than God you've got to renounce it I know it feels hard I know that there's history but don't lose your future because of a dishonest history come on begin to renounce that thing in your own way Lord come on whatever it is whatever it is competing for your affections come on in your own way Woo! Uh, come on do it for yourself do it till you have the faith for it come on you don't have to fight Jesus fought for it all you've got to do is receive it deliverance is here come on uh, Deliverance is here. Oh, deliverance is here. There you go. Come on. Deliverance is Those of you that were abandoned by mother and father, and it caused you to live your life in rejection. So you entertain every love that comes to you. Come on. Let the orphan heart be snatched out of your chest and receive the heart of sons and daughters. Come on. Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. An everlasting love. Woo. Deliverance is here. Deliverance is here. Say. Deliverance is here. Deliverance is here. Oh, listen. There's a scripture in the book of Obadiah. I want you to hear this as your promise. And it says, But upon Mount Zion there shall be deliverance and holiness. And out of Zion will come deliverers. But the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. It is very important that you pursue deliverance in your own life because you can't walk in your possessions as a prisoner. The prerequisite for the purpose of God for your life is freedom. And right now I speak over you, especially those of you 
that, have, that has been cursed. You've lived under the word curses of men and people and places. I command the blessing of the Lord over every area of your life. <laughs> oh yes, it's too late, devil. <laughs> Woo! I loose the blessing of the Lord over you and I say you are not cursed. Hey, ho! Oh! That you are not burned. Woo! -hoo! You are not ruined or robbed. But I say you are blessed in your mind. You are blessed in your spirit. You are blessed in your language, your intellect. Lift your hands. I prophesy your IQ up to the next level. There is a new release of genius. Better die. I say your IQ is going up. Your emotional potency is going up. Your adaptability is going up. There is even a brand new revival of creative innovation flooding your life. Flooding your life. Flooding your Receive it. I said receive it. It's only up from here. It's only up from here. Ah, you shall be called the ransom of the Lord. You will be sought out. I said you will be sought out. 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 A city not forsaken. A city not forsaken. Sought out among the heathen. Sought out among the ruler. Sought out among the judge. Sought out among the governor. Sought out among the princess. Sought I call you sought out. I call you sought out. I call you sought out. That is the word of the Lord to you. If you will pursue your freedom mentally, emotionally, physically, you will be called sought out. You're not going to have to go and look for favor. When your free favor comes trying to look for you. And I declare that before seven days has ended. There are price tags. Judgments. Properties. Negotiations and arrangements being made on your behalf if you mean business with God tonight it will not be one week from today where things that have been under the red tape all God wanted to know is if you're willing to have it as a free man if you're willing to walk in everything God's ever dreamed for you without the forces of darkness I want you to give God praise for whatever is on the way. Come on. Come on. Oh, something's on the way. Something is on the way. Oh yeah. Oh. Something's on the way. Get ready for your investors. Get ready for your partnerships. Get ready for a brand new interview. And the door that slammed in your face. Swinging wide open. He's causing missed moments to come back around. Everything you want ready for. You are more ready now than you've ever been in your life. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty.
We're going home. Listen, I have a word. One of the things that God is going to do for everyone in here that pursues their deliverance. Now listen, don't be afraid to journey with God. If a process got started in your life today, don't be discouraged if you feel the same over the next couple of weeks. you got to journey with God. But if you pursue it and don't stop, God will make you taste of the powers of the age to come. What would you do if I told you men are going to make mistakes that work for you? <laughs>